Hey everyone, welcome back to my channel. I hope you guys are doing super, super well. I missed you guys so much. I feel like it has been forever since I have been on here just, you know, doing a normal video, not my podcast. And I really apologize for that. I feel really bad that I have missed the past, I think it's the past three Sundays, which was so unlike me because I feel like I was doing so good of uploading on Sunday and Thursday. So the fact that I missed three Sundays is definitely not something that I want to keep happening. And I do apologize for that. I just have not been feeling my best, like mentally which is new to me I feel like I never really feel this low like obviously I get sad and obviously I have like my days where I don't feel my best but lately I have just been feeling so low and unmotivated and I just didn't even want to log on to YouTube to post or like look at anything I just felt really disconnected from everything so yeah that has not been fun I will definitely give you guys an update as to why I have been feeling that way maybe that'll be for like a separate video it has nothing to do with like my marriage or anything because I feel like that's always what people first think that it's like a break up or anything but it has nothing to do with that I will definitely make a video explaining to you guys what has been going on behind the scenes so I do apologize for missing the past three Sundays but I do appreciate the patience and the support that you guys give me and yeah I just really missed you guys so I'm happy to be back so today we're gonna be talking about what happened to 12 year old Fatima Varinha this is just wow I mean I actually cried while doing the research for this video because what happened to her is just so cruel evil and just so unfair it's also really sad because because Fatima's family not only had to deal with her death and with her murder, but they also had to deal with the aftermath of that, which consisted of receiving these very aggressive threats from the killer's family, basically telling them to leave the case alone or they would also die. So Fatima's family just went through so much and her mom is just so incredibly strong. She is really just out there every single day fighting for justice, speaking about her daughter, doing interviews, you know, being in the public's eye. And not only did she lose her daughter, but a few years after Fatima's death she also lost her son so it's just a lot I definitely want to put a trigger warning because what we're going to be talking about is very graphic and we're also going to be talking about the essaying of a young girl with that let's jump right in and let's talk about what happened to Fatima Fatima Varinha Quintana Gutierrez was born on June 4th, 2002 in Mexico to her parents, Lorena and Jesus. Now, Lorena and Jesus already had kids. They had three older children, and when Fatima was born, they were not really planning on having more children. Like, they had already surpassed that time, so they were not expecting to have a child, but when they found out that they were going to give birth to Fatima, they were, of course, so happy, and the day that Fatima was born, she was received with all of the happiness and love in the world. So as I mentioned Lorena and Jesus already had three children they had an older daughter named Jimena an older daughter named Janet and then a son named Omar between the three siblings Fatima had an age gap of between 9 and 13 years older so as I said the family definitely was not expecting to give birth to another child but they absolutely adored Fatima and from the first moment that the entire family saw her they just immediately fell in love with her and they actually gave her the nickname Tatis she was pretty much the baby of the family until two years later when Lorena got pregnant again and this time she gave birth to a baby boy named Daniel. Now since their other siblings were a lot older than them, Fatima and Daniel grew very close to each other and she absolutely adored her baby brother and vice versa. They were pretty much best friends, you know, they would do everything together, they were the youngest so they would spend a lot of time with each other and a lot of time with Lorena as well because the other siblings had already like moved out and you know had their own things going on. So Lorena had a very deep emotional connection with her son Daniel and with her daughter Fatima. The family lived in a house at the top of a hill surrounded by pine trees and greenery in the community of Lupita Casas Viejas in Lerma, Mexico. They lived peacefully in this house for more than 20 years. Lorena and Jesus worked so hard for their family. That was their priority. They wanted to make sure that their kids had a good life, that they had everything that they needed, and that their family was happy. Lorena had a sewing workshop from home and Jesus was a public transportation 
transportation driver. The two older children would go to work, and then the two youngest, Daniel and Fatima, would go to school. Now, growing up, Fatima was a very dreamy girl. You know, that's how her family describes her. She was a girl that loved to fantasize, that loved to daydream, and she also really loved to immerse herself into these stories that she would read and into these movies. So she really loved reading The Hunger Games, The Lord of the Rings, and Harry Potter. So she would literally like immerse herself into these stories and just like fantasize about them. So she was just like a really dreamy and, you know, creative girl. She also really loved poetry and one of her favorite poems was called A Margarita de Baile by an author named Ruben Dario. She would often ask her mom to read this poem to her under the shade of a tree that they had in their backyard. And the poem is really beautiful if you guys want to look it up after the video. Fatima dreamed of being a doctor when she grew up and Lorena says, you know, Fatima wanted to be a doctor because she wanted to take care of us forever and she just wanted to make sure that we would always be alive with her. On top of just wanting to make sure to take care of her parents, she also just wanted to take care of other people and she just cared so much. And you know, Fatima was a little girl when she was telling her family that she wanted to be a doctor and that she wanted to go to school. So I just feel like that definitely shows what kind of person Fatima was. She was just very dedicated, very hardworking at such a young age. She was very studious. Her dad says that she was on the honor roll, that she was one of the top students at her school. So fast forward to 2015, Fatima was now a teenager. She was 12 years old. She was still very studious, happy, and just full of dreams. She had her routine of attending school, which was around half an hour away from her house. And then she would come home from school in the afternoon to do her homework and spend time with her family. So everything seemed to be going well, but unfortunately, everything would change for the Varinha family on February 5th, 2015. On February 5th, Fatima began her day just like any other. In the morning, her father walked her to the bus stop down the hill, and then she went to school. When the school day finished, she headed back home on the bus with one of her good friends, Salma, who was also her neighbor. Now, normally, once Fatima would get to the bus stop after school, either her mom, her dad, or one of her siblings would go pick her up from the bus stop, and then together, they would walk back up the hill and then go to their home to have lunch together as a family. Her friend Salma would also walk with her, and then once they would get to like a certain point, Salma would go one way to go to her house, and then Fatima would go the other way to meet with her family. On this day, however, the family somehow lost track of time and they actually got caught up with work and weren't able to meet Fatima at the bus stop to walk with them. Now, this had happened a couple of times before. You know, sometimes the family would just be busy with work or like busy with doing something so they wouldn't be able to meet Fatima. And this wasn't like that big of a deal. Fatima would just walk up by herself back to the house, no problem. On top of that, she had her friend Salma to walk with most of the way anyways. So it's not like Fatima was walking completely by herself. So Loren and Jesus just lost track of time, but they knew that Fatima would arrive to the house by 3 p.m., like she always did. They waited and waited. Lorena started to make some sopa de fideo. She started getting everything ready for the lunch, but they realized that Fatima had still not come home yet. They continued to wait, but eventually 3.40 p.m. came around and Fatima was still not home. The family started to get worried. You know, Fatima was never late. She you know, would always keep the family posted as to what was going on, where she was going, if she was running behind, if she was going to go to a friend's house. But Fatima hadn't called or, you know, notified them about what was going on. With zero hesitation, Lorena, Jesus, and Daniel went out to look for her. Lorena says that she literally just like threw off her slippers and then put on her shoes without even tying the shoelaces because that's how quickly all of them left the house to go look for Fatima. They made their way to the bus stop to kind of, you know, trace her steps and see if maybe she was still there waiting for them or maybe someone had seen her and when they got there no one was there so they started to search around the path that Fatima would take to get home but she was nowhere to be found in their search they passed by the house of their lifelong neighbors the Ataide brothers which consisted of 17 year old Misael Ataide Reyes and 21 year old Luis Ataide Reyes now they lived down the hill in the last house just in front of a large wooded area when Fatima would have to walk home from school she would actually have to pass the brother's house and she didn't like passing by their house but unfortunately she was 
kind of forced to because there was literally no other way to get to her house. Like you had to pass her house in order to get to the route. So it was definitely something that Salma and Fatima did not like to do. Anyways, Lorena passes by their house and she sees that Misael was sitting on the railing in his front porch. So she walks up to him and she's like, hey, have you seen Fatima? Because again, she literally has to pass their house to get to her house. So it would make sense if he was sitting out on the railing that he might have seen Fatima pass by. So she asked Misael this and he says, no, that he hasn't seen Fatima. Now, at that moment, Lorena heard noise coming from the upstairs window, and that's when she looked up and saw that Misael's brother, Luis, was poking his head out, you know, kind of seeing what was going on. So Lorena looked up at him and was like, hey, have you seen Fatima? And he said the same thing as Misael, that no, he hadn't seen her. So Lorena is looking at these two brothers and she notices that both of them were freshly showered and there was just something weird. You know, like she had like a gut feeling that these guys maybe weren't telling the truth. So after they both denied seeing Fatima, Lorena started to get really worried because, I mean, if the brothers didn't see her past their house to get to her house, where was she? So she called Salma. She was like, hey, did you walk home with Fatima? Did you see her? Did you know where she went? Are you with her? And Salma was like, actually, the last time that I saw Fatima was in front of the Taida brothers' home right before they separated to go to their own homes. Lorena listens to this and she's confused because she literally just asked Misael and Luis if they had seen Fatima and they said no. But now Salma is telling her that she last saw Fatima in front of their house. So Lorena was like, are you sure that you saw Fatima pass by their house? Because they're telling me that they have not seen seen her. Salma was like, okay, you know what? Let me go meet with you in person so I can show you where I last saw Fatima. So Salma meets up with Lorena in person and she's basically telling Lorena like, wow, I can't believe the brothers are telling you that they didn't see Fatima because I literally saw them look at her with my own eyes. Salma says that she saw the two brothers sitting on their porch railing and that they were basically like catcalling and like whistling at Fatima as she passed in front of their house. When Lorena heard this, she started to get a bad feeling. Feeling. She told her son Daniel and Salma to go alert the neighborhood and to ring the church bell so that all the neighbors could group up and help look for Fatima. She also asked Daniel to go up to their house and alert Jimena and Omar about what was happening. Lorena truly thought that in that moment, Fatima had been kidnapped. So while everyone is like, you know, moving around trying to alert everybody about Fatima's disappearance, Salma showed Lorena the exact spot that she last saw Fatima. And while she went to go alert the neighbors about what was happening, Happening, Lorena began walking to that spot, which was like down a little hill from the brother's home. She gets to the spot. And that's when she finds Fatima's sweatshirt. The sleeves were still tucked in the sweater pockets and the sweater had blood on it. Next to the sweater, she also found a knife that was covered in blood. She found more of Fatima's clothing and then she also found Fatima's money that she would take to school. As soon as Lorena saw this, she just began screaming for help and she just began screaming for Fatima's name. She ran back up the hill asking everybody to help her search for her daughter. She approached her other daughter Jimena who was among the neighbors helping look for Fatima and she was like I just found Fatima's sweater in the pathway behind the Ataide brothers home so in that moment Lorena just knew that they had something to do with Fatima's disappearance she told everyone who was helping that maybe Fatima was in the woods behind their house so they all ran into the woods to search for her Lorena says that as she passed the Ataide brothers home once again to go into the woods she saw a third man there this man was Jose Juan Hernandez and I'm not sure what, what his relationship is to the brothers I don't know if maybe he's just like a friend of them or like another neighbor but when Jose Juan realized that Lorena had spotted him through the window he literally began running down the stairs with nothing but jeans and sandals on now Lorena thought this was so strange like why is he running you know, is he running because he's scared he's going to get caught? Is he running because he has something to do with Fatima's disappearance? She just thought it was so weird. So she actually began running to the house to see if she could catch Jose Luis to question him about why he was running away. But instead of seeing Jose Luis come out of the house, she was actually met with Misael one of the brothers. He was trying to escape the house and he was literally carrying Fatima's backpack in his hands. At the same time that Lorena sees Misael with Fatima's backpack, Jose runs out the back of the house and he runs into the woods. Lorena starts screaming, you know, catch them, like grab them. And she tries to, you know, grab them to stop them from running away. 
But that's when Misael actually pushed Lorena out of the way. Like he went like that with the backpack and Lorena fell to the ground and so did Fatima's backpack. And then he ran off into the woods with Jose. Lorena got back up as soon as she was pushed and she tried to run after them, but she eventually lost them. Can you imagine that? Like you ask them, hey, have you seen my daughter? They say no. And then you find out that they did see your daughter. So not only are they lying to you, but they also have your daughter's backpack trying to run into the woods. Oh my God, it's definitely crazy. And you know, at this point, like Lorena has not called the police to come help her with the investigation. Like she is doing all of this on her own. So after losing Jose and Misael in the woods, she comes back to the brother's house and she sees Fatima's backpack and tries to grab it. But then the neighbors tell her that it's better to just like leave it because it's evidence So, you know, you don't want to mess with like fingerprints and dna evidence, etc So lorena agrees to leave the backpack alone and then she continues with the search She goes back up the hill and sees that everyone is surrounding the ataide brother's house And her son-in-law actually managed to enter the home Now the only person left at this point was luis one of the brothers because at this point jose and misael have escaped the son-in-law and a bunch of the other neighbors actually forced themselves into the home despite Luis literally yelling at them, telling them to leave him alone, to not enter the house, etc. They all make their way inside and Jesus, Fatima's father, starts arguing with him while the rest of the neighbors start searching through the house and that's when they spot that in the backyard there was clothes with blood on them. Not only was there blood on them, but they also had mud. So they keep looking around and that's when they spot a bucket with water that had blood and mud inside it as well. So the neighbors started thinking like, okay, where near our neighborhood is there an area that has a lot of mud? Because this is a lot of mud to like just casually come by. So they start thinking about it and that's when they realize that there is a specific part in the neighborhood that is filled with mud. So they go to that area and they start searching for Fatima. When all of the neighbors and the family left the home to go search in the muddy area, Lorena heard people from a distance shouting that they found blood and Lorena immediately ran to them but she says that she was falling as she was running. Like that's how accelerated she was at this point. That's how... I don't even know how to describe it, but just like watching interviews with Lorena breaks your heart because she's like, I was running, I was falling, I was hitting myself on stuff. Like I couldn't control myself. That's how fast I was running because someone yelled, I found blood and I thought it was my daughter. She eventually arrived where everyone else was and that's when Lorena saw patches of the ground with like scratch marks and then she also saw blood. She looked around some more and as she turned her head towards the nearby highway, she saw a shoe. As she got closer, she realized that this was Fatima's shoe. Not only did she find her shoe, but she also found her sock. And she could also see part of Fatima's leg. Lorena says that there's just absolutely no words to describe what she felt in that moment when she saw her daughter's shoe and her daughter's leg. She truly thought that someone had like chopped her daughter's leg off and just like left it there and that her body parts were like spread everywhere. She just could not explain what she was feeling in that moment. And she just felt so much pain and just so much sadness. While Lorena is trying to process what she sees. At the same time, her son Daniel is shouting at her that he actually sees Fatima's hand sticking out of the ground. He was screaming, Mama, Mama, take her out. Fatima's there. Her head and hand are there. Lorena says that she immediately ran over and that's when they found Fatima's body. She was not, you know, cut up in different parts. It was just that she was buried. So her hand was sticking out in one part of the ground. Her leg was sticking out in another part because, you know, whoever did this had tried to bury her quickly. So they finally find Fatima's body and they do manage to get her out of the dirt. But at this point, it was too late and Fatima was no longer alive. Lorena says it was absolutely terrible to pull her daughter out of the dirt because her daughter just didn't even look recognizable anymore. You know, if it wasn't for her shoe and if it wasn't for her socks, she truly would have no idea that this was her daughter because that's how disfigured she was. Lorena says that she was just immediately outraged and she actually began throwing rocks into the highway and she stood on the side of the highway screaming that she wasn't going to move until authorities helped her because her daughter had been murdered. A truck driver actually helped her by parking his 18-wheeler across the highway. That way, no other cars could get through. The rest of the family eventually joined Lorena and someone ended up calling 911. As soon as authorities arrived, they went to go check Fatima's body just to confirm that, you know, she wasn't alive and that there was something else that they could do for her. But 
Unfortunately, as I said, it was too late and Fatima was declared dead. The authorities also asked the family to stop blocking the highway. That way a forensics team could come in and, you know, take Fatima's body away, take away the evidence, etc. So Fatima's family agreed to stop blocking the highway. Shortly after this, Lorena and Jesus were told that the neighborhood actually caught the three men and were attempting to kill them. So somehow the neighbors had caught Jose, had caught Misael, and had caught Luis, and they had literally doused them in gasoline and were trying to kill them. The authorities were like, hey, can you guys tell them not to kill these people? Like, we want to prosecute them. We want to send them to jail. Like, it's not right for them to kill them. And Lorena agreed with authorities and she told them to, you know, back off, to not kill them. That way they could get prosecuted. And she just didn't want the neighborhood to kill these three men she wanted justice for her daughter and she felt like she was going to get justice through a trial through a sentencing and you know through prison time so the neighbors were like okay you don't want us to kill them that's fine and they let the two brothers and jose luis go so now all three men were in custody and they were actually taken to a hospital at first because the neighbors did beat them like the neighbors were punching them kicking them doing everything before dousing them in gasoline and setting them on fire and doing whatever they were going to do so the three men were injured so they were sent to a hospital first just to take care of their injuries and they were actually in the hospital for 15 days so while the investigation continued an autopsy was conducted on Fatima the autopsy determined that she had suffered tremendously before her death and again I just want to put a trigger warning because what happened to Fatima is just absolutely terrible and just so inhumane. That day, Fatima was walking home from school as she usually did when all of a sudden, the two brothers, Misael and Luis, jumped out of the bushes and grabbed Fatima. After that, Jose also came out of the bushes and joined in the kidnapping. They then took Fatima to a heavily wooded and secluded area. They beat her so violently that they actually knocked all of Fatima's teeth out. They stabbed her more than 90 times with a knife throughout her body to subdue her they actually took out one of her eyes with a blunt and pointed object they broke her shoulder they broke her wrist her ankles and then on top of all of that they also violently r-worded her after that they started cutting up her face she had actually 43 lesions on her face chest and her private area what's even more disturbing is that according to forensics fatima was alive while they did this to her she was actually fighting back and trying to defend herself and and trying to kick them. She was putting her foot up to stop them from touching her. She was doing everything that she could to save her life. When the three men realized that she wasn't dying, they decided to drop three heavy stones onto her head. Now, these were heavy. They were weighing about 70 pounds, and one of the stones even weighed 80 pounds. They dropped these stones on her head, and that's how Fatima was killed. Her exact cause of death was severe craniocerebral trauma. After this, they tried to bury Fatima's body under dirt and leaves. You know, as I said, her foot was sticking out, her hand was sticking out, so they did bury her completely so after doing this they ran away from the crime scene they came back home they took a shower started to get rid of their blood clothes and I guess just hoped that no one would find Fatima's body. The forensics team said that she was found soaked in her own blood and the blood of another male. I know it's just absolutely horrible to hear that. That's the part where I cried, you know, doing the research. I just couldn't believe that someone could be so evil to do this to a 12 year old little girl. She was 12 years old. It's absolutely disgusting that these three men did this. Something that stood out to me from one of Lorena's interviews is that she said, you know, people like to say that my daughter was a fighter that she was this you know brave person and strong and this and that and she's like no my daughter wasn't a fighter she wasn't like a soldier she wasn't a strong person she was a 12 year old little girl that was just doing whatever she could to survive and to make it out alive so that she could be reunited with her family so going back to the investigation all three of the men were in custody now but unfortunately on february 23rd 2015 just a few days after fatima's murder misel was 
let free. Since he was a minor at the time, because he was only, I believe, 17 years old, authorities said there was simply not enough evidence to prove that he participated in Fatima's murder. Now, this was just a slap in the face to Jesus and to Lorena. They were so disappointed and angry, and they actually gathered with family members and with other neighbors to block the highway near their house again for hours, begging authorities to take Misael back into custody. This didn't work, and Misael was just let free. I mean, can you just imagine? Imagine the rage that their family and the community felt after learning that. They were also so outraged that it was known that there was male blood found on Fatima's body, but unfortunately, there were no DNA tests done on the men to see if that male blood belonged to one of them. Now, when Fatima's family asked authorities, like, hey, why aren't you testing the DNA to prove that, you know, this blood belongs to one of them? Authorities said that they weren't able to do that because they did not agree to it and that it would be a, quote, violation of their rights if they did it without their permission. Lorana just couldn't believe it. She said Fatima also had a right, a right to life and and they violated it. So these guys are really going to complain that their rights were violated by doing a DNA test when they took someone else's life. It's just not fair. And no matter what Lorena said, no DNA tests or pretty much anything were done. During this time of the investigation, the family was very vocal about Fatima's death. And because of how vocal they were, they actually started to receive death threats. They began receiving threats on behalf of the Ataide family and on behalf of Jose's family. Trucks would pass their home and they would shout things like, we're going to kill you, this isn't going to stay like this, etc. So the family reported these threats because of course they were scared for their life. I mean... Fatima has a bunch of other siblings. She has nephews. You know, it was a very scary situation for the family. So they reported all of these threats to the authorities. They did have protection assigned to their home 24 hours a day, but it didn't last very long. And the protection was soon withdrawn since personnel was short and they were needed elsewhere. So learning that the family had no protection anymore, the threats intensified. The family's home was actually shot up at one point and the verbal threats just wouldn't stop. The families would call the house at all all hours of the day just threatening them and it was just absolutely terrifying for the family. Jesus said that he actually had to quit his job as a public transportation driver so the family was just struggling financially at this point and they actually had to sell some of their personal belongings just to be able to put food on the table. Their children even had to give up their cell phones to sell them in order to get money to continue to pay the bills. So the family was struggling in every aspect of their lives. You know, thankfully they did have help from other family members but it just got to a point where they just couldn't help as much either. This is just so terrible. I mean, this family lost their daughter and because they're being vocal about it and because they're requesting justice, they now are receiving death threats. They're now losing their jobs, are close to losing their house. It's just absolutely terrible. So because things were getting so intense, the family actually seeked help from a civil organization called called CVM, and they sent letters to them asking for protection. So while the family waited for a response from the organization, the threats continued. People would show up to Danielle's school and they would actually ask the faculty like, hey, does Daniel go to school here? And then they would park outside of the school just waiting for him, I guess. So once the family caught on to this, they actually had to start sending Daniel to a different school. The older siblings were also being followed to their workplaces and even their own spouses were also being followed. It was like they were all surrounded and the phone calls just wouldn't stop. The stalking wouldn't stop. And the family would change their phone number multiple times, but somehow these people would find their new number and continue to call them and continue to leave them threatened. The family was so scared to leave their own home. I mean, they felt like they had no place to go. This went on for some time, and in September, the family finally heard back from the organization. They were told that they would be moved to a new home and that they would help them in soliciting refuge in another country. The organization began the process of getting passports for the whole family so that they would leave to another country, but unfortunately, they never followed up with it or completed it. The new home that they were sent to live in in the meantime had really bad signals so they were not able to call the police if they were in danger. They were given a panic button in the house, but it didn't even work. They were literally in the middle of nowhere and were in a way even more scared to be so isolated with little to no phone connection. The family was just so scared because they were hearing from other people in the neighborhood that the Ataida family and Jose's family were going around saying they better not come back because they will be killed. Despite being in this new place with supposed protection, the threat still didn't stop. At one of the hearings in 2016, Lorena actually received a direct death threat from Jose's father. 
And this guy said this in court in front of authorities and nothing was done to stop these threats. In 2017, the organization moved the family to another state called Nuevo León. There, they rented them a new home for a year and they paid for the trips to the ongoing trials back in Mexico City for Jose and for Luis. The family had to keep a very low profile during this time and follow the protective measures from the organization. So they couldn't get a new job, they couldn't renew their IDs, they couldn't get their social security. They the new house that they were in was paid for and it did have furniture but in an interview Lorena says that the house was just like empty like the house yeah had a bed but it didn't have a blanket there was no plates no forks nothing and the family didn't have money to put food on the table or to buy a blanket and to buy this stuff because again they didn't have jobs so it's like how were they supposed to pay and like get by if they couldn't work and the government wasn't providing them with any help Lorena says that they were told that they were pretty much never going to be able to return to their home ever again. She said that she doesn't care about losing all of the material things or even living with no means, but what hurts her the most is that she can't return home to her home, you know, the home that they lived in for the majority of their lives. They just felt like prisoners in their own country, and Lorena was just so heartbroken when she saw a glimpse of the rest of her life. You know, was her family ever going to stop living in fear because they were trying to get justice for her daughter's death? They just felt helpless, like either they stop asking for justice to, you know, get death threats to go down and maybe be able to move back to their home. But then they're just giving up on getting justice for their daughter. So they just felt like they had to continue to fight, even if that meant that they would never be able to return home. Not only was Jesus and Lorena dealing with this, but Daniel was also struggling a lot as well. Fatima was his best friend. You know, they grew up together and he was actually the one that discovered Fatima's body. So he says that what he saw was just like engraved in his brain. You know, seeing his sister buried in the ground disfigured covered in dirt was just absolutely terrible and because of that and then everything else that was going on he was just becoming very depressed very sad and it was just really difficult for him to get through this time you know he was doing his best to be there for his family and you know to stay strong but he was having a lot of anxiety and he would actually have frequent nightmares of seeing Fatima buried in the dirt it just absolutely haunted him and because of this, he began to harm himself. So the family was just going through a lot in their personal life, but also in the fight for justice. Things were not looking good in the courtrooms. Not only did Misael get let off the hook, but so did Jose. He declared innocence and he said that he had a solid alibi for the day that Fatima disappeared. He says that at the time of Fatima's murder, he was at work. He worked as a gardener in a private school just two hours away. And he even had this surveillance footage proving that he was working. His family and the school actually corroborated this. So because there was this video footage showing Jose working at the time, he was actually let go despite all of the witnesses seeing him right there the day that Fatima was murdered. Now, Lorena says that she was so upset about this because first of all, the video surveillance footage didn't have a timestamp. So that video could have been from any other day. Wouldn't be surprising if Jose had tracked down that video, threatened the school, and told them to corroborate his story. And that video was just from another day that he was trying to pass off as the day of Fatima's murder. So Lorena was so upset because she's like, literally there's no timestamp, there's no date, there's nothing to prove that this was taken the day of Fatima's death. And on top of that, all these people saw him at the Atay the Brothers house that day. So they just knew that this was a lie, but the judge just dismissed all of the witness statements because the judge was like, you know what, there's a little bit of inconsistencies in the statements and they let Jose free. So now now, the only person left to be held accountable for the murder of Fatima was the oldest Ataide brother, Luis. He was taken to court, a trial began for him, and in the end, he was sentenced to 73 years and four months in prison for the murder of Fatima. Although this was good news to the family because, I mean, at least one of them was caught, they were still upset because there were still two guilty people walking the streets free to live their life. Not only was it a disrespect to Fatima that she wasn't receiving justice, but there was also now a risk to the public and to the community that these two men were free and were maybe capable of committing another horrible crime to another little girl. Everyone was just so outraged. You know, the community and the family just was not going to give up and Lorena and her family made sure that their voices were being heard despite all of the threats. They continued fighting and fighting for justice and 
In 2017, about two years after the murders, Misael was arrested again. At this point, he was now 20 years old. Now, I'm not sure what he was arrested for. There was like some conflicting statements in the articles. So I don't know if he was arrested for something else or if he was just arrested again for Fatima's case. But in the end, he was sentenced to five years in a juvenile institution. At his sentencing, the judge also said that he has to pay a fine for damages to Fatima's family. Now, Misael's mother was present during his sentencing and she told the judge that they don't have the means to pay Fatima's family and asked if they can pay in very small payments little by little. I'm not sure if the judge agreed to this but Misael was sentenced to this institution for only five years and was let free in June of 2022. Lorena just couldn't believe that they were treating him like a child. You know, the cruelty that he showed to Fatima is proof that he is no innocent child who just like made a mistake. Like, no, he participated in this. He killed Fatima. He awarded her. He should have been tried as an adult. Lorena was outraged and she said, quote, The day you killed my daughter, I had the possibility of killing you but I didn't do it because I am not like you nor like your mother who covered up for you. Now, the judge was not happy with this statement and the judge actually told Lorena that she needs to respect Misael's right to remake his life. Can you imagine being told that? It's just enraging. I mean, why does she have to respect the fact that Misael can like do better and improve himself and like have a new life when Fatima will never get to live her life? She'll never get to turn 15. She'll never get to turn 21. She'll never get to get married, have children, nothing but yet Lorena has to respect the fact that Misael made a mistake and is trying to like be better in November of 2017 the family began receiving additional legal help and even began working with a lawyer who helped them appeal Jose's freedom and this worked. The appeal was granted and in 2018, investigations reopened for Jose with the video that he provided showing that he was at work the day Fatima was killed and it was submitted into the court system to review and, and you know just to check the validity of this video. Jose and his legal team actually failed to appear at the first hearing and when the second one came around, the judge placed him in preventative detention while they waited for the investigation to continue. Now meanwhile, Fatima's brother Daniel, who was now 16 years old was getting very sick. In November of 2020, he was complaining about feeling a very intense stomach pain, so the family took him to a hospital to get checked out. Unfortunately, this is when things just started to go very wrong. The family started to go from hospital to hospital to hospital begging for help because Daniel said that his stomach was hurting and that he was in so much pain that he couldn't even sit up, but all the doctors just kept saying that he was having an anxiety attack. Because at first, you know, Lorena pulled up to the hospital and was like, hey, my son is complaining of stomach pain. He's he says he can't breathe. He says that he can't sit up. And the doctors were like, well, has anything recently happened in Daniel's life? And Lorena would explain, you know, well, yeah, his sister was murdered and he was the one that found the body. So as soon as doctors would hear that, they were like, oh, that's it. You know, he's having an anxiety attack because of what happened to his sister. But Lorena and Daniel were like, no, this is not it. Like, this is real stomach pain. It's something with his intestines or something with like his appendix. It's something more serious than just an anxiety attack. At the fourth hospital that they went to, the doctors actually gave him a painkiller and an antidepressant to take and then they just sent him home without running any tests or even touching his stomach to see what was going on. They didn't do an ultrasound, they didn't do x-rays, nothing. So they send Daniel home but that's when things just started to get worse. He was going in and out of consciousness from the pills and the family didn't even know the dosages that were given to him. They also couldn't move him because he was in so much pain and it's just really really sad that four different hospitals told the family the same thing, that it was an anxiety attack when clearly it wasn't. Fortunately, on November 24th, 2020, Daniel died in his father's arms. At this point, Daniel was barely breathing. He was huffing and puffing. And at one point, Jesus says that blood was coming out of his nose and his mouth. And Lorena was in the other room when this was all happening. So Jesus ran out of the room and told Lorena, our son just died. Oh, Lorena said that she just, she just immediately lost it. She could not believe that 
She had lost her daughter to murder, and now she lost her son to negligence. The preliminary diagnosis was that Daniel, quote, had a hole in the intestinal cavity where gastric juice was leaking and had invaded the lungs. So it wasn't an anxiety attack. There was actually something wrong with him, but the doctors refused to check him because they just thought, you know, he's anxious because his sister died. So it's just really sad, the negligence that happened at these four hospitals and how, you know, Daniel died because of this. So after this, the family actually returned back to their hometown to bury him. In one of the interviews, Lorena said that she felt like she was just in hell. You know, like when the reporters were like, how did you feel after losing your daughter and then losing your son? And Lorena was like, I just feel like I'm in hell. I feel like Mexico is a hell that I just can't escape. So now Lorena was mourning the death of her son and the death of her daughter. And again, she just felt like there was really no point for her to continue living. That there was a lot of dark thoughts going through her head that she was just like, I mean, what's the point? My daughter isn't going to get justice. My son isn't going to get justice. I mean, I just, that's too much for anybody to go through. That's too much heartbreak. That's too much pain. That's too much unfairness it's just all so wrong it wasn't until october of 2021 that justice was finally served and that jose was finally sentenced he was sentenced to life in prison because the judge deemed that the videos he presented to prove his alibi they were fake and edited which again lorena was saying from the start she was like these videos are edited i mean they literally don't have a timestamp or a date so like how are you just believing his word so it's unfortunate that at first the judge didn't believe lorena and then lorena learned something very disturbing she learned that jose had previously told his friends that he liked fatima and that he wanted to R-word her after he saw her passing by one day when he and his friends were smoking. Definitely just makes it seem like this was something planned. Like maybe the brothers and Jose had seen Fatima passing by the house every single day. Became They became obsessed with her in a way and decided that one day they were going to kidnap her and finally do what they wanted to do to her. After the sentencing, Lorena said, quote, I feel good. Fatima in the end got justice. I know that no one is going to give them back to me, nor is this life imprisonment going to give me my children back. This is an incentive for all the mothers who fight, who walk day by day, who have years to walk and to achieve access to truth and justice. Not only did they murder our daughter, they murdered an entire family. They killed us all. They left us without life, without freedom. We want to recover our peace. We want to be free because here in Mexico... We are prisoners. According to statements from the family, to this day, they have not been able to return to their home. They remain moving locations constantly, and their beautiful house at the top of the hill is now sealed off with remaining visible bullet holes. Lorena is now working with families of victims to ensure that they don't go through the same thing that her family went through. She actually said that she feels like a bad mother for stopping the neighbors from trying to kill the brothers and jose because remember they had douse them in gasoline they were ready to lynch them but lorena said no that she wanted to spare their life but now she regrets it in 2022 a memorial was made for fatima in one of the busiest and very important parts of the city fatima was actually one of the 35 memorials in a campaign called against impunity and oblivion it was to be a quote reminder for all public institutions that society is outraged and seeks justice for all the victims of the entrenched gender violence in the country to this day jesus and lorena are still fighting for justice for their son daniel in november of 20 2022 they made him a memorial as well they just went through so much like i said lorena said that she just felt like she no longer had the will to live you know that nothing else mattered but what keeps her pushing is her other children her nephews her nieces and also that there is still so much justice to fight for you know her son daniel needs justice the doctors that diagnosed him wrong need to be held accountable and someone needs to pay for this what breaks her heart is that fatima was only a hundred meters away from her home like she was almost there when she was taken by the brothers and Jose and it's just so scary that this happened in broad daylight too. Like this happened at like 2 p.m. I was watching an interview with Fatima's father Jesus 
And he says that when he discovered what had happened to his daughter, he just wanted to take his own life simply because he is a man and men murdered her so violently that he felt like he should kill himself because men are just terrible. I mean, these men just absolutely destroyed a family and... My heart goes out to Fatima and to everyone affected by this. I'm so sorry that this happened to her. She seemed like a wonderful little girl that had a full life ahead of her. And it's just really terrible that these three men decided to take her life. I truly hope that the family eventually finds peace, that they're healthy, that they're safe. And I just want to end the video with something that Lorena said in regards to advice that she would give to families dealing with this. You know, families that are fighting for justice and, you know, trying to get laws changed and trying to get people sentenced for what happened to their loved one. She said, no se callen, no se queden callados, griten, hablen, peleen, hagan lo que tengan que hacer para tener justicia, no se callen, which basically means don't be quiet, stay vocal, stay loud, yell, fight, protest, do whatever you have to do to get justice for your loved one, but just don't stay quiet. That just really made me sad because there are just so many families that deal with this and it's just so unfair and I just wish that this would all stop and it's just a really, really evil world that we live in. With that, that is what happened to Fatima Varina. I really appreciate you guys taking the time to watch today's video. I would definitely love to know your thoughts on this case, so please make sure to leave me a comment down below. If there's ever any other cases that you would like me to cover, you guys can leave me a comment or you guys can submit it through my case suggestion form, which is linked in the description box down below. If you haven't seen the latest episode of the podcast, please go watch it. That would mean everything to me. I will have it floating up here and I will also have it linked down below. But all right, you guys, that's pretty much everything I have to say. Thank you guys again so much for being here and I will see you all in the next video. Bye, guys.